the the only council we're now live on youtube right the the only um apology i've received count uh, chair is from councillor sweeney Chair, can I just tell you that I have another meeting I've got because they've been rearranged I have to leave to seven, seven o'clock Councillor Carter Okay, thank you Councillor I am uh, just working on bringing up my agenda on this uh, on these new e on this new system because they appear to have disappeared Janet, could you do me a favour and just forward me the papers again in a in an yeah, email because they don't seem to be em embedded where they were just a minute ago. Yeah, of course I can, Chair. Thank you. Does anybody else need a set of papers from the mm. members? Did we have anybody um, coming to speak on our other item just before we get to it on the item relating to the taxi trade? Chair, I've just forwarded you the agenda on the email. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Chris. Okay, so if we're all here, I'll um I'll start the meeting. I presume anybody else who was going to join probably uh, isn't joining at this stage if they've not uh, sent help for uh, connecting in any way. Um, so welcome everybody who is here for uh, our licensing committee on the um, on the second of second uh, of March again. Um, having a meet on Zoom, uh, it may be the last time we we have to do so, but we will we will see. Um, so, firstly, do we have any apologies for absence? We have apologies for absence from um, Councillor Sweeney, Chair. Okay, thank Can you. Can you hear me? Yeah. That is, thank you, Janet. Um, members' interest, uh, to remind members of the need to declare any interest, even now or as, uh, as the items arise, um, that we have on our agenda. Um, Admission of the public, um, we're not excluding the public for this meeting and it's the same arrangements as we usually have um, on Zoom uh, where we will bring people in um, at, their, at, their turn to, at their turn to speak, uh, particularly on the on our first and most substantive item where we do have a few people who've indicated um, they'd like to speak. Um, minutes of the meeting held on the 15th. I'll just pull these up. So back on the 15th of September, we met. Uh, are people happy of, uh, that they're a correct and accurate record? Yes, Chair. I think uh, Councillor Allen's moved that, I think, uh, and then Councillor Lambert seconded to help for the minutes. Um, and if there's no uh, disagreement, I'll consider that, that um, passed uh, as an accurate record. Um, okay, so our first... Um, our first item uh, tonight is the, uh, the license for um, Della Salsa Club. Um, officers have prepared a report. I'll um, hand over to officers, whoever's going to lead the presentation on, on, on this one. That's something I can, I can start on. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, the, this is about the, the other application for the renewal of the sexual entertainment license for La Salsa, which is uh, 24 Silver Street, Halifax. The renewal application um, was uh, taken uh, from the applicant on the 20th of November 2020 and was open to consultation from the 23rd of November uh, 2020 and was, uh, was consultation to the public and responsible authorities 
30 objections were received. Um, police and ward councillors were also consulted and no objections were received. The current licence expired on the 12th of December, uh, but the application uh, was bought, uh, well, is best scheduled to uh, come to this meeting today. Um, so the, um, the establishment has been permitted to open pending a decision, but it hasn't opened as a uh, sexual entertainment venue since March 2020 due to the pandemic. Um, as you'll see as part of your packs, there, uh, there's guidance uh, given for refusal of licence, which is under 5.1 of the Council's uh, licensing of sex establishment, which is in Appendix 3 of your pack, and also the uh, Home Office guidance for sex establishments. Um, so looking today for a decision to uh, grant licence, to grant licence with additional conditions or refuse the licence. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, I want you to also take the opportunity to, do, to uh, introduce yourself in your new role for anybody who doesn't know you. I'm not going to let you slip through without, without <laughs> doing that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, but, uh, my name is John B. Croft Mitchell. Um, I am the new Senior Partnership and Enforcement Officer for the Council, and I'm now, I suppose you say, uh, replacing uh, Fiona Goldsmith, who used to have this role. So this is my first meeting. So uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, John. I'm sure you'll enjoy your first meeting. Um, do any of the other officers wish to wish to give a comment before we, we get in or give a comment perhaps on any of the particular statements in the objections? No, thank you, Councillor. No. OK. Um, so I would understand that we would wish to invite the, the objectors to speak first in terms of the correct procedure. Someone give me a nod. Okay. Chris, yes, objectors yep. first. Agree that chair, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, have we had an order in which they've uh, registered with us, uh, Janet, and I will uh, call them in that order if there's not a, a, a better order preordained? Bear with me while I bring up the list, um, Chair. I'll be a minute, thank you. Could I ask that everyone who's not um, speaking at any point um, mutes their microphone? I'll be conscious to do the same, just so it's just to make sure that we can uh, um, we can hear people and we can't find out what you're listening to on tele. So while we're um, waiting for the um, waiting for the objectors to speak, that does remind me this would usually be a point at which we would invite um, members to ask any questions of officers at this point from what they've read in the report. So whilst that list is coming up, do members have any questions that they wish to um, that they wish wish to raise at this stage? I mean, we'll come back to this again once the objectors have, have spoken, which will perhaps draw out some of the pertinent points. Councillor Carr. Can I just ask a simple question, really? Is there any is there any pertinent new information on this application than there was on the last application? No point in me asking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's um, that's a, a point I can come in. Um, other than um, other than with uh, the pandemic um, uh, over the last year, there uh, there's no further pertinent information. Uh, other than that, I said in my opening, which is the the venue hasn't opened as a, a sexual entertainment venue since March last year. It has opened uh, as a an alcohol uh, licensed venue in the meantime, um, as uh, restrictions have allowed. There's no there's no new legislative stuff from the last application. No. There's no more law. No. That's all I needed to know. Thank you very much. Derek did very well, nodding his head.
sometimes that, that's all it takes on a Zoom call. Angie, you've still got your hand up. Feel free to come in if you're wanting to. Um, uh, no, thank you, uh, can, uh, Councillor Carter. Um, basically, asked the same question as I was going to um, ask as well. I was just going to add a comment, but not to worry. I'd rather listen to the objectors beforehand. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Councillor, um, Janet, do we have a list then? Yeah, through you, Chair. I've sent you the, I've, I've sent you an email with the list on. If you've got oh. your emails open, no, yeah. I can read them out. It's okay. I'll uh, I'll I'll pull this up. There are thirty um, of them. Ah, uh, <laughs> now do we do we know which which ones have indicated to speak? Because I'd rather not list everybody's name who has objected. Uh, we, I sent you through some emails yesterday of people who sent questions in, Councillor yeah. Sutherland. Okay. Um, all right, then we'll start with um, Chris Green um, as you're in the room already. So, um, Chris. Okay. I'd like to you okay with that? Yeah. Got it? You've got me? Yeah. I, can, I can hear you. Um, Perfect. You don't have yeah. Yep. Through you, Chair, if the if the objectors do not wish to reveal the, the, themselves in person, they are quite um, the, we are quite happy for them to remain as a picture or or just as their name on the screen. There you are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. It was not deliberate that I was not revealing myself. It was okay. Um, it's interesting that um, we feel that there's no additional, no new information, because I think there, there is particularly, I mean, the two things strike me as new, new parts of information. Uh, the first is that an authority which has, if you like, um, a historic link to entertainment, like Blackpool, is now working towards having zero sex entertainment uh, establishments. And I think that's a major move forward. Um, and if they can see their way to doing it, and if they see no legal obstacles to doing that, then I find it strange that Calderdale finds it appropriate to still grant licenses. Um, that's in addition to the nearly a dozen other local authorities that have no problem with having uh, established a zero limit. And the second point I'd like to make is that the uh, establishment is for sale at the moment. And that would seem to me very quite bizarre in that you're licensing one person to have um, a, a license uh, for this establishment. And then if it's sold, and interestingly, the, the um, articles for sale do say, as a lap dancing club, you're licensing an individual and they're, they're advertising it as an institution, not as an individual with a license. And I see there might be a contradiction there as well. So those are the, br very briefly, apart from the well-argued and established points that we continue to make about the authorities, public sector, um, duty, it's public sector equality duty, um, to consider the requirements and the impact on all women of the existence of this kind of establishment, um, which you seem not to want to do. Um, and I would say the law requires you to look at it every year with fresh eyes, not to say, oh yes, we looked at it once 22 years ago and we're gonna let, grant it over and over and over again. Every year you have a requirement to look at it with fresh eyes. And with that, I'll bring my remarks to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'll, I'll invite members if they want to ask any, any questions of individual objectors um, as we go, but we can sort of do a general round of questions at the end when we've heard objectors too, if people are happy doing that. Are there any questions that people wanted to put to Chris Green? No? Okay. Thank you, uh, Chris, for, uh, for attending. Um, I presume we'll do a shuffle on the panellists now. Um, so we'll do them in the order I see them. I've got um, a, a Jade Serpents next, Janet, if you could 
Um, I'd met her if she would uh, like to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello. I can. Hi. Um, I haven't got a question to ask as such. Um, I actually submitted a pre-prepared PDF document to um, is it Tilly Chapel um, as requested over email to submit my questions beforehand. Um, I was merely attending as a panellist uh, just to be sure that this document had been brought to the attention of the councillors. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, if you if you've got um, nothing further to add, I know all members will have uh, will have read the document. I'll um, thank you for coming forward. I'll check if the other if the other participants who are in the who are in the waiting lobby do want to speak. Would you just give me an indication in the chat so that I'm aware that you do want to speak? Um, and then I'll invite you on the basis that you've popped up. Ah, well, there's a very affirmative yes from. Uh, Sasha Rakov. I hope I've pronounced your name right. Um, so, Janet, would you be so kind as to remove panelists as as well as adding new people on? Saw you as I saw you as uh, well, Ma Mara. Um, sorry to put you on the basis of a, a, a speed typing test on the basis of your order, but it seems as good as any. Um, Okay, Sasha. Um, I think that's I think that's us reordered. So, um, uh, if you want to address the committee, I'm uh, happy for you to begin when you're ready. Sorry, were you talking to me? Yes, I was inviting you to address the committee. If you want to take um, oh, a couple of minutes time to to give your uh, to I, give I got totally cut off. Then wasn't somebody else speaking just now? No, they indicated that they didn't want to speak, and you were the first. You were the first oh, one to pop okay. up in the chat saying yes. <laughs> so yeah, okay. I've dropped you straight. I've dropped you straight in it. Oh right, okay. I uh, just introduced myself. I actually helped bring in SEV legislation ten years ago. And since then, I've been involved in two successful high court cases against one council for breaching equality law in its pro strip industry stance. So I feel I have some understanding of what I'd speak about. Um, just to say, I find it quite surprising that people think there's no new relevant information. I presume that means nobody's read a lot of the submissions, including our own, from not buying it. And I urge you to please read that before you make a decision. Because we went through last year's licensing hearing, which was on video, so it's all recorded. And it was actually, as far as I'm aware, can work out, it was an unlawful decision, as was your decision last year. It was based on misinformation provided by the legal counsel for the club, who appeared to outright lie at times, which is um, unlawful, the breach of licensing law. And the decision seemed to be made, and I can quote from the councillors, that they thought... Um, They've got no justifiable reason to refuse. That was Councillor Pillau, Pillay. Um, Councillor Clark, we can't really refuse. Councillor Holden, we've got to make sure any decision we make tonight will stand in the court of law. The problem is that you were told, and you seem to be under the impression that you cannot refuse a license if there's been no change in the locality, which is absolutely untrue. There does not have to be any change in the location. There doesn't have to be any material changes whatsoever from the previous year in order for you to refuse a license. And this has gone into great detail in the submission we made, along with rulings from judges and from other legal experts. So I urge you, please, to look at that, because you are fully entitled to refuse this license because it is in an inappropriate location. It always has been. You can come to a different decision simply because you're now aware of this fact because you clearly weren't aware of it at the last licensing hearing not least because you were grossly misled by the the solicitor for the club and I've gone through all the many ways in which he misled you there so if you make a the similar decision this time that it's you can't refuse it because it hasn't been a change in location you're not applying SCB legislation appropriately and you could be taken to court not by the club but by objectors 
I would also add, as we go into great detail again in our um, objection, that if you refuse on the grounds that it isn't in an appropriate location, then the club operator has no recourse to legal challenge. All he can do is try and go to the High Court and take you to judicial review, which no strict club operator has ever successfully done. In fact, usually now the High Court judge throws it out instantly. So, it, I mean, it's easy as that to refuse this license. The whole point of SEB legislation, and I know because I was there at the time it was drawn up, I helped get it drawn up, the whole point of it is to make sure councils and the public who you represent, your taxpayers, your voters, have far more of a say rather than prior to that when strip clubs were licensed like cafes. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I would urge you please to look at our submission because it's written very simply and clearly, but it references <laughs> with links to all the case law that you need. Oh, I would also add that you can, you're can. you also supposed to look at any potential future change in location and other circumstances. So obviously I presume the location is going to change in the near future. There must be shops and so on that have shut down. So the locality has changed. There's also gonna be a very another serious change, which is that the women working in that club when it does reopen as a strip club are gonna be absolutely desperate. So the likelihood of exploitation and abuse is gonna be sky high. So you know, you need to know if you relicense this club then you are basically legitimizing all the abuse and exploitation that's gonna happen in that club and with all the brothels that it feeds. So these are all things you must take into account when you make this decision. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I would urge you to read this report, um, given the way you were misled by the solicitor's lawyer at the last meeting. I also think you probably need to take legal advice before you make a decision this time, in case the solicitor misleads you again this time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carter? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Can I just ask, did you refer to me earlier? Uh, sorry. Who we... Sorry, I can't see who asked that. Who, is you, who are you? I'm Councillor Carter. Did you refer to me in your, in your comments at the beginning? Councillor Carter? Uh, no. So from the minutes of the last meet, well, from the video of the last meeting, there was a councillor Pillay, I'm sorry if I'm saying the name wrong, councillor Clark, councillor Holden, who also- Councillor Clark, okay. That's okay, it's councillor Clark and not, and not uh, councillor Carter. Um, I specifically asked a question at the beginning of officers, is there anything any different now to what there was when we got this application originally? And I found it extremely difficult when I sit here, I've been told no, and I get told that the legislation is totally different to how we are interpreting it, because I find that very difficult to how we how we go forward. Well, exactly. So That's why you need to. If this, if this, if if the if if what is being said has any relevance and any bearing, how am I supposed to know that information, and how am I supposed to get that information? And and I find it extremely difficult. Well, I think this is one of the problems. This is our experience. I've worked with a lot of councils and a lot of them have not been properly trained. Often they're trained by the solicitors and barristers who represent the strict clubs. So the information they're getting is going to be <laughs> ambiguous at best. Often they're trained by people who work in the industry. Okay. The right, let's, thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's just, Chris, I'll let, I'll let you come in, but when, I'm not going to continue with any... Um, mm -hmm for further mm -hmm. comments about claiming that people have misled the committee right. at the end of the day chris wait at the end of the day if there was a judicial review done against last year's decision um then that would have exposed the illegality of it and i think that um without that it's a bit too easy to come and come and make those comments in the committee chris very briefly chair the law which you adjudicate on tonight is is the same as the the law last year which is the um, schedule, schedule three of the local government miscellaneous provisions up about 82, and that law hasn't changed. Okay. I mean, I'm not naive enough to think that we don't sometimes get it wrong as a council, um, but I presume that if we if we were if we did get this wrong and we were working under incorrect legal advice. Chris, that this that we could be taken to some sort of judicial review and our decision could be overturned 
if we weren't acting appropriately? We could, Chef. We could. Okay. So there is that that fail safe if we are acting on incorrect legal advice that can be demonstrated. Is there any further questions um, to the, the this objector? No. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sasha Rockoff, for coming and speaking to the committee. You're welcome. Um, and I noticed that Moira had also indicated she wanted to speak. If we could let her in, please. Hi, am I okay to start now, Councillor Sutherland? Absolutely, Myra, whenever you feel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I mean, I want to endorse everything that Chris and Sasha said, um, and I'll come back to it because one of the issues is not the law, it's slightly the interpretation and the advice that's given, which could be different in different circumstances or in different people's interpretation of it. But I wanted to come to my specific questions, which are hopefully you've got, and I know you've got tons of paper and you won't have had time to read it all. But the first question is, do we need it? Does a town like Halifax need a sexual entertainment venue? The primary purpose of which is to stimulate any member of, of the audience to sexually stimulate a member of the, members of the audience. Do we need that in town where people are wandering about <coughs> from pubs and clubs where a woman was actually assaulted last August, police went in and found her unconscious. So you might decide we do need it, in which case it's your choice, but you do have the power to decide that we don't need it. Uh, my second point is, uh, again, relating to this dreadful year we've been through with the pandemic, it has been established that, that the job losses among women is much greater even than the job losses among men. And the, 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 the rise of poverty is extreme. And women have got responsibility for feeding their children with the help of a certain footballer, thank God. Uh, and so we have to think about the pressures on them to enter fringe industries or, or di directly up to and including uh, the sale of sex. And that's been happening and there's evidence of that. So I think we need to consider that as part of the context in which we're operating now, which is different from last year. And the third one is the, the character of the applicant. And this is one of the things that's slightly difficult because um, I think some, uh, somebody put in, I think it was Jade, a list of all the, 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 excuse me, the prosecutions, the closure of the Huddersfield Club, et cetera, that relate to this applicant. Now, year after year, and I have been coming along for a long time, and uh, you know, it does get tedious, but every time I've raised things like that, I've been told you can't discuss that. And then a few years later, uh, well, they can discuss it, but it's too late now because it's not relevant because it was years ago. So there is a question of the advice, the way the advice is given and whether it's strictly, you can't discuss that or you can discuss that. My final point is about the, um, again, relating to the character of the applicant. I have provided, I think for about the last three years, uh, evidence that uh, this applicant has had uh, money confiscated under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Now, I mentioned it about three years ago as an article in the Asian Times, and I was told by the applicant solicitor that that was not true. That was completely not true. Last year, I actually got a confirmation letter from the PCCs through an information, their information officer saying, yes, it is true. This is the amount of money that was taken. And it was at the magistrate's court in Wakefield uh, and it was seized under proceeds of crime act. So that is something that's quite debatable. We were told that it wasn't true. And then we were finally told last year, having accepted that it was true um, by, I forget which solicitor, that this council doesn't need to take any account of the PCC. Well, I find that really hard to believe. It's not whether you need to take account of the PCC or not, it's that this is a fact. And the West Yorkshire Police and Crown Commissioner said, once again, this highlights good job by, work by West Yorkshire Police. Detective Constable Tony Chapman of the Calderdale Proceeds of Crime Act said, this is another example of how we can use the Proceeds of Crime Act legislation to ensure that cash obtained dishonestly is paid back. We would like to encourage members of the public to report those believed to be living beyond their means. He was confiscated, he had £117,000 confiscated. That is a fact, it's not a matter of opinion. And whether you need to consider the PCC or not, factually or legally, that is a fact. So I think I'll just stop there and leave it with you. I know you won't have a time to read everything because there's too much and it's impossible, but please think very carefully about all those factors. Thank you very much, Moira. Thank you. Um, are there any questions at this stage? 
No. Okay. Thank you. I'll let you go. Thank you for coming and speaking again. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, at this stage, if there's no questions from councillors, I'm, I'll um, invite invite the applicant. Oh no, I think we've got two. So wait a second. Know that you're coming after a couple of questions. Um, Councillor Lambert and then Councillor oh, Councillor Gallagher. No, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, we asked earlier, uh, was there any changes uh, to any of this? And after listening to the two um, um, speakers of the uh, people opposing, is there any 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 significant? Is there any police reports? You know, it'd be interesting to know what police reports in terms of um, like for like with let's say Yates's. Has anything changed in terms of exterior? You know, this is what I'm asking for. And I'm also asking, have we got any of the people that are employed there, there here to speak on behalf of the club? Well, we seem to have the opposers and not the ones for. We've we've got we've got the applicant. I think that might be his manager who's in attendance within Bobby Joe. I think we've seen who we've seen before. So I don't know if they might both intend to intend to speak. Um, I'll bring Councillor Lambert in and then I'll let officers pick up pick up that point around whether there has been anything in from West Yorkshire Police. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I was just going to raise exactly the same point as uh, Councillor Carter raised. I do feel very, very, uh, very unsure about being um, actually sat here tonight making a decision and having um, allegations raised that, um, is it Saskia, that, that she raised. I really would like to have some, uh, a bit more of a detailed conversation really with our, with our um, legal team about this really. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lambert. Um, have we had any, anything in from West Yorkshire Police? Chair, for me, um, it, there's been there were no objections from West Yorkshire Police to the application. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I will. Um, I will invite the applicant. Um, and is uh, his manager a representative to uh, to address the committee? That's when you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, yeah, great. Right. Uh, okay. Well, the first thing we, we we really didn't think we needed a solicitor this time because everything was. Uh, well, we haven't been open since la since uh, last committee. However, there were a few things I can I can raise. The first one, when the, when the gentleman said, uh, one of the gentlemen said the place has been for sale. Yes, it's been it's been uh, for sale, but it was the building. It's a building been for sale for nearly ten years now, but not the business. That's basically uh, one thing I wanted to clear uh, regarding the regarding uh, our venue again probably you all know but we've been open since 2000 well this is 19 years now we've been open in that location uh, since we started and uh, basically there was no report of any any police report nobody has ever got into trouble because of us and basically it's one of the safest places in town if you can, if you want, you can you can actually uh, get some more information from the police because this is one of the places that we don't get that much of a trouble whatsoever. People are coming very polite. Our our performers are well trained by the manager and by our experienced staff. Uh, we dancers are even getting trained how to talk people, how far they are standing, what even the words they are using. And from other hand, we don't have a, we don't have that many of the freedom of like like other ones like like restrictions on the on the dress code we have over there. So it's more like a cabaret. It's not, uh, and when it's it's quite insulting when 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 some of the uh, members well uh, uh, complain. You know, some some objectors are talking about s selling sex and things like that. It's just a cabaret, just a show bar, with no touching. 
everybody are very professional and uh, and to be honest no changes whatsoever there was another question about about the changes there was no changes whatsoever uh, last year you had you, uh, you had my uh, uh, basically uh, records with the police and everything everything was clear and I, and I, I don't know if I if I need to explain things again and again and again every year but uh, I have never ever been convicted for anything it's uh, whatever it was, it was an argument over, over, over a tax about four or five hundred thousand pounds that I transferred here to, uh, uh, but anyway, I don't know if you want, if you want me to explain things, I don't know if, if it's the right thing because that wasn't even a criminal matter. Yeah, uh, that was just a, that was just a over, over transferring money if it's, anyway, I'm not going to go to details because it's more technical. Uh, oh, my records are clear, my manager's records are clear. 19 years, no problem whatsoever in the town. Obviously, police can vouch for that one. Licensing can, can they, we get a lot of regular uh, visit from the, from the council, uh, licensing department of the council. And if there is any question I can ask. So to be honest, I didn't think it's gonna be, uh, you know, it's gonna be a big deal regarding explaining things because it's nothing has changed since since last committee anyway. But anyway, if you have any question, if you have any question from, from Bobby Joe, because she's she she's in a day-to-day -day, uh, contact with, with, the, with the training, uh, staff training and uh, and customers, and basically we record everything. Everywhere is, uh, all club is covered by CCTV. Anytime, any members, uh, they can come and visit. Obviously licensing can come and visit. Uh, so it's been, clear as a whistle, everything. So it's just simple as that. It's, it's, uh, and nothing not, nothing changed in 19 years, basically. Thank you. Bobby Joe, do you wish to add anything? No? Thank you. Okay. We might end up getting some questions. Okay. Um, members, do we have any um, questions at this stage for the applicant? No? Okay. Oh, no. Councillor Clark. You were there in the corner. But you are muted. One of the conditions of um, the last licensing renewal was that the, um, the signage outside was changed or taken away. So why has that not happened in that time since? The window actions. Can officers confirm if there was, a, or the applicant confirm if there was a change to the deck hall? No, there isn't. It's still there. Sorry, are, are, are we talking to me? Uh, I don't know if anybody might be, could be able to confirm that. Was that changed in last year's application? I think it was one of the conditions. Oh. I can't say I recall that. I don't know if the uh, the officers have the the report from last year to hand, or, or it presumably would be in the existing conditions. That's what I'm just trying to. If say. a change was that like that was made, but I don't recall. Councillor Gallagher. No, I was just going to say. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just going to say it would have been in the minutes, and I can't remember anything about the decals. Um, thus, me. Um, specifically <laughs> mentioning the exterior of the uh, property. There's more offence in other establishments than what I can see on the exterior of La Salsa. Mm. I mean, I, if... if I'm just trying to find the last one, last one. Yeah. It's okay. Move, move on, please, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, if there was anything that we did agree previously that hasn't been dealt with, we'll, we'll pick up on that from the enforcement side, um, I'm sure, um, that, we'll, that we'll be able to check over on that after the meeting, but I don't, I don't recall it. So we'll, we'll, if we proceed with what we've got um, in front of us. Um, if there's no further questions, I'm happy to take comments and motions then, um, members. Mm -hmm. Chair, can I just draw some threads together from the legal standpoint from some of the points which have been raised? 
please do. Yes, that was um, your decision must be restricted to the criteria in Schedule 3, subsection 12. I, I, I did mistakenly say before Schedule 12, it's actually Schedule 3, Part 12. And um, in respect of um, points raised by, as I recall, Chris Green, who referred to a change or proposed change to Blackpool and their um, limit or removal of sexual offence, sorry, sexual and attend venues. What different councils do does not have an, a direct impact on other councils. Each council is required to its own policy, bearing in mind the criteria in Schedule 312, which includes the um, the locality in nature, the area. The fact that the premises is or may be for sale, if you were to consider that, it would have to dovetail with the criteria of Schedule 312. Um, Chris Green and Sasha Rakoff did allude to um, a decision based on no change. This has been referred to in case law, which is quite well established. And um, it, it was referred to last year, Chair, and um, it was a 2014 case which involved Oxford Council and uh, a party called Thompson. I'm sure we can make the full case available on um, online after the meeting, but it did say that the, the, the ruling from the appellate uh, court was if there's an application for a renewal, <coughs> then <coughs> it was not necessary for an objector to demonstrate there has been a change since the last grant, but that if the application was refused, then the committee must give reasons for refusal and, and have due regard to the fact that the license has been previously granted. Um, in respect of the points raised about the character of the applicant, um, the guidance from the whole it's quite clear that we have a, a one point of contact, and that is at um, paragraph <coughs> three two. Excuse me, a check mark point. So we have to inform the local chief officer of police as to an application and the, the, the local chief officer to Cardadale is West Yorkshire Police. West Yorkshire Police do have the relevant access to the databases, uh, police national computer, DBS, etc. So therefore the police are the person we go to for checking of the um, character of the applicants. The Police and Crime Commissioner is a separate body and wouldn't have access to the resources which the Chief Constable has. Thank you, Chris. I see uh, Councillor Carter has indicated. Mm. Chair, thank you very much. Um, the more that one attends these meetings, the more that one gets confused. Um, 5.2 uh, within Calderdale's um, papers, Appendix 3. It talks about relevant locality for uh, 
a license can be refused under various issues. But what it does specifically say that it's a decision on an application will be based on its assessment of the character of the locality at the time of the application is determined. And this may include any developments in progress. And there is nothing within this, within this policy that I can see, if Christian found it for me, then okay. But there's nothing that I can see in this policy that says that you have to take into account anything at all that's been done in previous times. Each application is judged at the time of a, a, a application, not on, because it actually does say if the sexual establishment venue is located or is to be located. It, it, is, it distinctly says in our policy, it's, it's relevant at, relevance at the time, not as what's happened in the past or what, what might be going to happen in the future. And I'm finding this little bit of an element very Confucius. I'll be honest with you, I've taken some more legal advice today and I've been told under that legal advice, you cannot take it, you have to take it as it is there now. And it's actually wrong because that is not what our policy says. So what is right, what is wrong? I'm not bothered which way is right or wrong, but we can't have a policy that says that, it's, that each application is treated on its merits at the time of, of submission and being advised by, by the solicitor that no, we have to take into account other things and it's not just about now. And that's why I find it extremely difficult, Councillor Sutherland. It's not about, it's about answering the points that are being raised to make sure that I am making the correct decision on the correct information that I've been given at the time that I am supposed to be doing it. And whilst I've said all that, as you know, I have another meeting at seven o'clock. And that sounds going to look as though I'm now copping out of any, any responsibility. And actually, it's not about that. The day's changed. <laughs> and if it had been yesterday, it wouldn't have been an issue. But I already had a diary meeting at seven o'clock today. I think it goes all that, that requirement. Well, uh, to the it's briefly that um, each application is fresh, but the, the case law guidance is that the a committee has to have due regard to a pre a previous grants and if it departs from reasons, sorry, from its previous grant, then it must give reasons. It's no bar to a change. And I think Chris Green um, didn't actually say those, but I think Chris Green was trying to um, use the term uh, it's been it's been done for the last many years, and therefore it's gone again. That's not the case. It's simply due regard has to be given, as per the Thompson case, the Oxford Council Thompson case, and reasons have to be given if there's a change. But you are not stopped from changing the decision, Chair. Why does it say in our policy that we have to take into account case law? Because how the heck am I and any other person going to know what case law is? And I find what? it, if, the, if, there's a, if there was a piece in there that said that we should also take into account an irrelevant case law appertaining at the time, then life would be a heck of a lot easier. Mm. But uh, we are where we are, I guess. Right. Chair, um, case law is the law of the land, as as um, acts of parliament are, and natural justice would dictate that case law and statute is taken into account in every decision made by a council. So it isn't something, Chair, which has to be put in a policy. It's simply part of, it's in the DNA of national justice. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, everybody. Um, what I was going to suggest um, in terms of the case law, Councillor Carter, I was going to suggest, if at all possible, that Chris could possibly just give a brief outline as just how important that the case, case studies are. But you've already done that, Chris, and thank you very much. That's all I was going to say. Thank you. Um, I can... The... Just briefly, the case was our application of Thompson, Oxford Council, 2014. 
on the main thread of what I've advised you was in paragraph 30 for the judgment. And um, I, I can have the entire judgment circulated or the reference because it's, it, it, it is public. Um, the comment said by the uh, judge was that um, I consider that while it was open to a subcommittee in the present case to depart from the decision of its predecessor, it was on their duty to take account of the earlier decision, grasp, grasp the nettle of disagreement with the earlier decision and to state its reasons for coming to a different conclusion. That's the thread which runs through that case, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chris. Well, conscious of the time, um, I think we need to be conscious to move to a decision or if we are choosing to defer to go and consider legal advice. But I think with, with you going soon, Councillor Carter, I think it'd be better to try and do that whilst you are here. Go ahead, you got your hand up as well. I think I was just going to say, I think everything's been answered. We, we, in the submissions from some of the objectors, felt that we did not take into account various things that had happened. We were not taking the right advice. There were issues around all that. And, and I think that that has been answered by Chris's um, comments to, uh, in the last few minutes. So um, I, I just wanted to thank Chris for, for clarifying what that is, that we've not taken into account, that actually we have taken into account. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carr. Any further questions, comments, or we're going to have to take a motion, members? No more mission to put forward a motion. We appreciate this is a very difficult one that we have to deal with every time. Um, I feel we are again in the position where we don't have um, I feel that the mood of the meeting is clearly not enthusiasm for the application but as I'm feeling to hear uh, an alternative or a motion to refuse and give a reason for it then we do need to move forward so if no one else will put forward a motion uh, then I will put forward the motion to approve the application. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, will all those in favour... Oh, is there any alternative motions? If anybody wants to put one forward. No. Will all those in favour please show? And those against? Okay, that's carried. Thank you and thank you for everybody uh, who attended the meeting for that item. Councillor, we also need anybody who's abstained. So I presume the others have all abstained, yeah. We're all happy that you've confidently abstained, okay. Thank you. We don't normally do abstentions, do we, Chairman? I'll leave that to the committee section to decide on the minutes and we can discuss the minutes next time. I'm not uh, okay. going into that now, but. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I will take us on to this uh, next item. So if you do need to leave as Councillor Carter, thank you for being present. I'll allow you to segue. You've already jumped. Did, um, thank you everyone else who's attended. I'll let everybody jump out if they don't want to stay for the next item. Oh, sorry guys. Can we know what was the decision? What was the? Uh, the decision was to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So you can leave if you want, um, or you can stay for our final item, which is on um, taxes. That's, I'll leave that one for you, up to you. Um, okay. Is that about us? Is it still about us? Or no, it's not about you. Oh, that's fine. It's thank, not you, about you. Thank, you. thank you, everybody. Thanks. Okay.
Okay. Um, are we all settled in terms of the reshuffle? Uh, and I know Councillor Pillai was hoping to get into the meeting. So if he, if he was still actively trying, does anybody know? No. His internet was down. He did, he did call me to send his apologies. And if he can get back on, he will. Okay, I think we shall just pr proceed. Um, John, are you starting the presentation on... Um, yeah, no problem. This report. Well, I'll, I'll hand straight over to you if everybody's happy for us just to get straight on and and get uh, and get into that one. No problem. Uh, no problem, Chair. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, this is in relation to a, um, a strategy guidance um, which has been uh, received from the um, Department of Transport in July last year. Um, it, in the paper, I don't I don't wish to go through in detail because it actually is. An, it's, it's a quite a hefty document and uh, the report that Fiona produced actually does highlight some of the key points but the main the main um, function of the uh, of the uh, statutory guidance is to, um, is to is for the protection of children and vulnerable ad adults um, over 18 from uh, from harm when using uh, when using taxis and private hire vehicles um, I've obviously relatively new in post, but actually as of uh, been working through this documentation, there's a lot of work which has been done over the course of the, the last couple of years, which actually puts us very much a, ahead of the curve on the statutory guidance. Um, certainly in terms of um, the DBS checks and the update service, which we, um, which we work with the, uh, the sector on uh, and has been well received. It's some, uh, the, a lot of uh, what it is in this document which is actually already part of the policies i mean the recommendation to members is to resolve to renew uh, the current uh, review the current policy and procedures in relation to the uh, taxis and private hire licensing but one would say that actually for us it's, it's a case of due diligence um there's over the course of the last year certainly during the pandemic the the sector has been very forthcoming uh, when we've approached them on matters of public health, so whether or not that's um, PPE uh, for drivers or lateral flow tests and more laterally with vaccinations, um, um, the, uh, the sector has been very engaged um, with, uh, with us as an authority. There are a couple of things which um, I personally, as I've been going through uh, and, and I want to sort of check and sort of the due diligence side of it, uh, specifically the um, multi-agency safeguarding hub. We do have one in Calderdale, uh, which operates uh, and has done for many years. I just want to do the due diligence that licensing is actually part of that, um, um, as part of that hub. And also I think um, as a partnership, um, we're, we're exceedingly good at um, working with other authorities in other areas and that's certainly over the last few, well certainly over the last year um, my work which um, prior to coming here was in emergency planning we worked very well with other authorities as much matters of the um, in relation to the pandemic and other emergency matters but I think there, I just want to check that um, part of the recommendations here is the sharing and licensing information with other authorities and one thing that part of the due diligence I would like to do is to ensure that actually that the National Anti-Fraud Network and developing their register is where we are with that and actually how that can be incorporated in, in our policies. I think I think Derek wants uh, wants to sort of come in on this, but I think it's really it's there's been a lot of work done over a number of years. We're ahead of the curve, but also we're also coming out of a pandemic, so there will be lessons learned that we can pick up out of the back of that, which would feed into any sort of future changes to the policy. I don't know. If that, that's it from me, then. Thank you, John. And um, welcome, Councillor Pillai. Uh, thank you for your perseverance in joining us. We would, John was just giving us um, uh, the, uh, his update on the second and final report. So just so you know um, where we are. Thank you for joining, and I will I will take um, uh, John up on the suggestion to answer Derek, who I know has done um, well ever since he came into 
uh, post working working in this field has done a tremendous work with the taxi drivers. But over the past year, with an enforcement hat on and um, working in partnership with the trade, I think it's I think we've seen a flourish. I think we've got to the best state of the relationship it's been in years, and um, I think actually that's that's come from uh, a bit of give and a bit of take all round, and we've ended up in a much better place. And you know, Derek's been uh, leading on a lot of that, so I'll, I'll hand over to you, Derek, to uh, comment a bit more on, on the report on, on other matters. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I'm conscious of the time, so I won't say too much, which is unusual for me. Uh, what, what I will say, though, is I do think that, first of all, thank you for introducing John. Uh, no disrespect to Fiona, and we wish Fiona all the best in her new post, but it's always nice to have a fresh pair of eyes come in and look at it, and I'm particularly keen to pick up on what John says about doing our due diligence, so I see this as an opportunity for us just to make sure that we do that due diligence, and in particular, make sure that those links across West Yorkshire are as strong as they can be, and I know, Chair, that you too have tried to promote a, a West Yorkshire approach when we can, and we've had some difficulties, not least COVID, in, in trying to do that. So I think that's a challenge that we've got ourselves, really, in the next uh, six months to maybe try and re-engage at a West Yorkshire level. I do also want to say well done and thank you to the previous management team and services that managed this area. Uh, Calderdale, again, I'm proud to say, took a leap uh, of faith, uh, worked upstream on the Louise Casey report that came out from the Serious Case Review into Safeguarding in Rotherham. And that led to uh, a really good partnership approach with uh, the neighbourhoods team, with the trade, uh, with the police, whereby online training and indirect and direct training was given to well over a thousand taxi drivers and that training continues to this day. So a lot of the recommendations, we were ahead of the curve, as John says, we, we, we seized the opportunity and we've embedded them into our day-to-day -day procedures. But again, and I'm sure members would not want us to be complacent in this critical area that John's arrival will give us an opportunity to do that due diligence. And uh, if it's okay with you, Chair, we will bring back any con areas of concern or any areas where we feel that we've missed an opportunity based on the quite weighty uh, guidance and uh, uh, that's come out from the Department of Transport. And then if you don't mind me, Chair, just to just go off at a tangent, just to say uh, thank you for those kind words. I have to say that the relationships with the trade through this 12 months has been critical to successfully tackling the pandemic. Uh, we know that we've still got a long way to go, uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel and the cooperation and support we've had from the trade and the community and members in dealing with these unprecedented times, I think has been remarkable. And I think that has contributed to, for us to dealing with some really difficult and challenging issues. Uh, that's not to say we've still got a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm sure there will be areas that we want to revisit. And I do think it's important, Chair, that we look at our policy and current procedures in light of lessons learned during the pandemic. I think not only have we had to do things differently, I think there's things that we've done far more efficiently and effectively. And I think it's important that we take those lessons learned into any future practice. So uh, sorry to go off at a little bit of a tangent there, Chair, but I'm hoping you give me a little bit of mandate to do that. But I just want to take this opportunity just to say that I think things have really, really worked well, but I also want to credit the work that was done back in 2015 in response to the Louise Casey uh, inquiry and the fact that we were upstream uh, again in Calderdale in challenge, in, in, dealing with this quite difficult situation. That's it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And uh, I think it absolutely is a good opportunity when we've got a report like this where we are a bit ahead of the curve. We should take the opportunity to, to recognise that, but also recognise that there is, there is more work to do if we want to stay ahead of that curve. I think we've seen um, 
in many ways a bit of a cultural change in terms of how the past year has brought us together and I think people across communities have recognised how taxi drivers amongst others like in supermarkets have been there working every day no matter what um, and I think it's maybe changed some perceptions of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of people and I think that uh, you know it's definitely perhaps worked with the trade and I think people have recognised that especially people who maybe lost the usual bus route and uh, have come to have come to rely on on taxes at a, at a time uh, when when a lot of other things have been in in chaos and um i think that by working together we've often maybe used the stick quite a lot as a council but actually there's been a bit a, a, a lot of carrot and a lot of opportunity to work together and um this is a group of people who've worked very hard during the past 12 months they've worked with us i hope we can keep thinking as a council about how we can support them um, support them to keep keep going economically viably um, but also on other things I mean we've talked about CCTV um, in, in cars before and I know that that's a big ask for the drivers and I know I often wonder from a from a perspective of some of your other objectives Derek as to what the what the value of some of that might be as part of a as part of a stronger relationship with the trade um, because when that relationship is there and it's good and you've got that information flowing then the stuff in these policies is the is the bare bones and what really brings it to life is is having that information and, and, and that link and relationship to, to share and 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 to understand where where one another is coming from um any comments or questions members no well if anybody if nobody wants to come in then i'm quite happy for us to go on and cancel pila Chair, all I'm going to say is I'll echo the sentiments that you have just said uh, and to add under the difficult times that we've had for the last 12 months. And I think uh, credit to all concerned, including the officers and the trade uh, for the system to have progressed this far. I'm very satisfied. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pillai. Okay, well, I will... Um... I will move. Um, I will move the recommendation. It does have a blank date on it. Do officers want to put a date in, or put a to be determined by whichever one of you wants the decision of determining it? I'm quite happy with. Quite happy with that. Um, I'm presuming we won't be having another committee before the end of the municipal year. Not that we'd be taking it to that, but just to check for members, we're not planning to put one in. in. April and others talk about some potentially urgent item, but if it helps, Chair, can I suggest six months then? Does that work? I'll leave it. I'll leave it with officers if they're if they're happy with something like that. Councillor Allen, are you indicating? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, I totally agree with everything that Councillor Peel has said. Um, both himself and myself, we've been on this committee for a long, long time. I think I feel we're part of the furniture. Um, but I do totally agree with everything Chris has said. And yes, um, I would also recommend six months. Okay. So we've got a proposal there. Moved and seconded, I believe, uh, for uh, to, to return in about six months. Within six months, uh, I'm sure officers will be able to manage that. Okay, if 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 that's not you indicating again, Councillor Allen, I'm going to go straight to the vote. So, will all those in favour please show? Okay, I think that's carried unanimously. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I will just stick in at the end. Uh, a thank you to Fiona Goldsmith, who has moved on to uh, another role in Kirklees Council, I believe. Um, so good luck to Fiona, who I'm sure is sat at home watching. Let's see. We'll see if she takes any one of us. <laughs> all right. Not. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, and I'll see you all again soon. Chair, just as a matter of apologies for turning up late. No, thank you for persevering, Chris. I, it was beyond, beyond my, my control on this end. Take care, everybody.